the outside of the uh, St. Nicholas National Shrine, we finished for the 9-11, uh, the 20-year anniversary of, uh, of the destruction of this whole area. Uh, the interior component of the, of the church will be ready sometime in the second quarter of, uh, of 2022. The Patriarch will be here on, no on November 2nd for what they call the opening of the doors. So he will be here for that particular uh, service. What's, what's important to note is uh, the people behind what's taking place here, because that's always the most important thing. It would not have been possible to finally build the St. Nicholas National Shrine without certainly the friends of St. Nicholas, who were formed to raise the funds and to have the intellectual wherewithal to build it. Certainly it would not have been easy to do or impossible to do with Archbishop Elpido Poros because he had also the vision when he came in to understand what was taking place. Certainly those who helped Father Carluzos without him and his tremendous abilities to raise funds to help become very important. So me, I'm just, I'm just assisting, but there are very well-known people who are within the Friends of St. Nicholas. They include, for example, Dennis Neal, who is the chairman, uh, we have uh, Michael Psaros, the vice, the vice chairman. We have people like John Ketsamatibis and, and many other people, serious people in the Hellenic American community, without which this could not have been done at all. Let me explain some of the unusual features and very different features of this building than any other building. For one, okay, we have uh, Pantelic stone that's on the outside of the building but it's the same vein as the, as the Pentelic stone that's on the Acropolis itself. Only the Greek government could have allowed that stone to be used on any other building except the Parthenon. This stone is sandwiched into two glass, glass panels. Okay, so the outside glass panel is etched. So it's visually, when you look at it, you don't see the reflection of the glass, a very unusual process. The stone between the two panels, the Pantelic stone, is, is three millimeters thick. They took the Pantelic stone, cut it into 12 millimeter. They cut the stone in, in Greece. They shipped it to Germany. The Germans then sliced, sliced that three quarter inch stone into two pieces. They milled the stone down to three millimeters, three millimeters thick, which is less than an eighth of an inch. It's like, it's like this, okay? Sandwich, uh, sandwiched it in glass in, in uh, Austria. In other words, from Germany, it went to Austria. In Austria, they sandwiched the glass. So you have stone in, uh, in uh, Greece, in Pantelic, in Pantelic stone, in, uh, nor uh, in north of uh, Athens. Transported to Germany, where it was sliced and honed down to three, three millimeters. Sent, sent to Austria with, with a, one of the outside, outside glass panels coming in from Spain in order to, to, make, to make the panel. The panel then was shipped to Minneapolis in the United States for fabrication. Before they could do this, because this has never been done before with this type of stone, with this type of glass, the way it's being done, never done before. Before they did that, they had to do special analysis, structural analysis for uh, freeze-thaw cycles, because here we are, in uh, Northern America. So you have free store cycles over here. So there's structural issues. And the whole concept is this, why so thin stone and why glass? Because there's lights behind, behind this rain screen, which will, which will uh, light up in the evening and this building will glow. The dome is also blast proof. It has 40 skylights and it has quadruple glazed special glass that could, was made, could only be made in New Zealand. So the glass was made in New Zealand, brought over to Canada, where it was fit together, and then brought to the job to put up. What is the significance of some of these things that we're talking about? Number one, 40 skylights. The Hagia Sophia has 40 windows. I don't know if conceptually they, they thought of it this way, but it's very important for people to understand historically, Hagia Sophia, when, when the, the Romy were there, in the evening, 
there was such a huge glow. There was such a huge glow because of the candles. In the old days, they used candles. There was huge glow that you can you can see the Hagia Sophia all the way down to Bosporus because of this glow. Okay, that the church had. So this is similar. This is going to this is going to glow in the evening. The church that was destroyed on 9-11, the only religious building that was destroyed on 9-11 was not a new church. It was an existing structure that the Greeks who lived in this area bought and converted and converted into a church. This area here was known as Little Syria. Little Syria. And the reason why they called it Little Syria is because during the Ottoman period, Syria also included Lebanon. So when we say little Syria, we don't mean that the Syrians were here, but the Lebanese Christians were here. And the Lebanese Christians, as we know, are both Maronites, which are Roman Catholics, and Orthodox, the Lebanese. So this area was a combination of, of multilingual, multi-people, many Hellenic people, Lebanese, etc. It's St. Nicholas Church. Of course it is. It will always be an Orthodox Church. But it's also called, and they're calling it, the St. Nicholas National Shrine. This particular building is also a cenotaph, a monument to those who died, almost 3,000 people who died on 9-11. So for people who don't understand, this is a monument to those who have departed, who are not buried here. Obviously, you're going to allow during the day, not when they have church services, etc., for other people to come in to light a candle in memory of their people who died, of all faiths, of all religions. And some people have a problem with that, but there's something wrong if they don't comprehend what we're talking about. This is, as you look at it, it's almost a church on a hill. A church on a hill, because we're elevated. There's a park behind us, mm -hmm. and down below is the reflecting pond where all those people are, are memorialized. This is the church on the hill that will glow, of course, it's an Orthodox Church, but it represents humanity, mankind, a cenotaph, okay, which is, which is what this is all about. It's a great, tremendous thing that we should all love. This is, to a certain degree, also a Parthenon on the hill. Not only does it have the, the, the feel of Hagia Sophia, quite frankly, but also is a Parthenon in it. Now, what was the Parthenon? The Parthenon was the temple of Athena, the Parthena, okay, the virgin. But what some people don't realize when they think of the Parthenon, they think of an ancient temple. They don't realize that the Parthen, Parthenon was also a church for the Panagia for a thousand years, more years than it was a pagan temple. So this becomes very important because it ties in also intellectually into what Calatrava was thinking about when he designed this particular church. He was thinking of the Parthena. He sketched the, the, uh, the icon that's in, uh, in Hagia Sophia, and then conceptually, when we go to the front, you'll see that it takes on the image, and when we step outside the building and you see the form of this church, you see exactly this particular design. This is what, what he sketched for me, okay? And that's why he is not only a famous, well-known architect and structural engineer and all the rest of that. Calatrava is an artist. He's a thinker. And a lot of these things that we're talking about, many, many people will not understand. It, but if you know history, if you understand the, the design of Hagia Sophia, if you understand the design of, of the Parthenon, if you understand the history of these particular structures, everything starts to fit in the genius that took place in order to create this work. Again, Friends of St. Nicholas, the Archbishop, showing the vision to push forward and do, and do what has to be done, and also the people who were, who were behind it in terms of the construction. For example, Richard Brown, who's a, who's a member of the uh, Friends of St. Nicholas and who's in charge of the construction, has been absolutely tremendous, a tremendous individual a logical individual. We have this expertise and the contractors, obviously, to get this thing done. So without, without them, there would be no St. Nicholas National Shrine. And everyone, everyone should applaud them. Friends of St. Nicholas, 
Archbishop of Ilaforos, Father Carluzos, Richard Brown, and the whole team, the contractors, the, the construction manager. These are the people that all of us, not only in the Hellenic American community, but throughout the world should applaud for the tremendous job they are doing.